Hey guys, Carlson back to finish up chapter 11 with you, starting off with section 5, which talks about the various types of white blood cells that contribute to our body's defenses. Now, other names for our white blood cell would be a shortened abbreviation, WBCs, or leukocytes is a more scientific name. Um, they are larger than red blood cells. They do contain a nucleus with other organelles, and they protect, protect the body by defending against invasion of pathogens and by removing toxins, waste, and abnormal or damaged cells. And they're traditionally divided into two groups. Now, they are a very much smaller population compared to our red blood cells, though. Uh, one of the groups is granulocytes. They contain an abundance of stained granules, um, which are actually secretory vessels and lysosomes. And then you have the agranulocytes, which is kind of misleading because they do contain granules, but they're very, very small and difficult to see under the microscope, even when stained. So uh, these are our white blood cells. You have neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, and those are going to be our granulocytes. Um, then you have your monocytes and lymphocytes, and those are your uh, agranulocytes. So notice that the agranulocytes end in the term site, and the granulocytes end in the word fill, and that might help you remember the difference between the two of them. Now, white blood cell circulation and movement. Um, unlike RBCs, white blood cells circulate for only a short portion of their lifespan. Uh, they migrate through loose and dense connective tissue of the body. They use the bloodstream to travel from organ to organ as needed, and then also for rapid transportation to areas of invasion or injury. And our white blood cells are very sensitive to any chemical sign of damage to surrounding tissue. So once it's detected, they're going to leave the bloodstream immediately uh, to enter that damaged area. And there are four characteristics of our circulating white blood cells. They're all capable of amoeboid movement, which is a gliding motion, which is helped by the flow of cytoplasm. They can all leave the bloodstream. Uh, they do this by something called diapodesis. Uh, they squeeze through the adjacent epithelial cells in the capillary walls. They are attracted to specific chemical stimuli known as positive chemotaxis, uh, which guides them to where they need to go. And then neutrophils, eosinophils, and monocytes are capable of phagocytosis, which if you remember is engulfing of objects, in this case it's pathogens, cell debris, and other materials. Our neutrophils and eosinophils are actually sometimes called microphages because they are a little smaller than the larger macrophages like our monocytes that uh, have become actively phagocytic. Now here are your types of white blood cells and, and other formed elements of the blood. Uh, I would think it'd be a good idea for you to make a small drawing of each one of these so you can differentiate between their uh, characteristics and what they look like. Uh, their general abundance would be a good idea as well, especially in a differential count what the percentage is, a brief description of their function, um, and the remarks kind of what you would expect to see of them. Um, just so you know, this purple region in the granulocytes in the agranulocytes, that is the nucleus. And in the neutrophils and eosinophils, to some extent, it's a segmented nucleus, kind of unusual to what you're used to seeing in diagrams. It's just being a circular uh, version of a nucleus. Now, the differential count and changes in the white blood cell abundance kind of go hand in hand. Um, our white blood cell numbers are going to change if we have infection, inflammation, or allergic reactions. And we can see this by examining a stained blood smear. Uh, and we call this count a differential count. We take the number of each type of white blood cell per 100 white blood cells counted. Now, if we have leukopenia, that's going to be a reduced number of white blood cells. Leukocytosis is an excessive number. While leukemia is a cancer of the blood, uh, forming tissues and exhibits extreme leukocytosis in most cases. There are other forms that may indicate the presence of abnormal or immature white blood cells known as BLAS. Uh, without treatment, unfortunately, all are fatal. Uh, the formation of white blood cells starts off with the hemocytoblasts that we talked about before. These are the cells from which all the formed elements are developed and they're present in the red bone marrow. They produce the lymphoid stem cells that give rise to lymphocytes as well as the myeloid stem cells that give rise to all the others, red blood cell platelets and all the other white blood cells. Now many of those lymphoid stem cells also migrate to lymphatic tissues uh, such as the thymus, uh, spleen, and lymph nodes and they are produced there as well by lymphopoiesis, which is just the making of lymphocytes. Moving on to section six, which talks about our platelets. Um, they are another component of the formed elements. In non-mammalian platelets are nucleated cells and they're called thrombocytes, so it's kind of a synonym, but for humans, uh, we kind of consider platelets fragments, so that's what we tend to prefer to call them as a platelet versus a thrombocyte, but you'll hear it both ways. 
The formation and functions of platelets, well, let's start off with the formation. The megakaryocytes are found in the red marrow and are enormous cells with large nuclei. And what they do is shed their cytoplasm in uh, small membrane packets. And these membrane packets end up being our platelets that enter the bloodstream. And you can see uh, kind of the formation starting off with that myeloid stem cell, megakaryoblast, which is an immature megakaryocyte. And then these uh, precursor extensions are what kind of shed off and form our platelets. They continuously replace after circulation of 9 to 12 days and they're removed by phagocytosis from other cells like your other white blood cells that we mentioned with phagocytized cell debris. They initiate the clotting process, they close injured blood vessels and are a major participant in uh, the vascular clotting system which we're going to talk about in a second. One third of the platelet population is stored in the spleen and other blood rich organs and they are mobilized during circulatory crises such as uh, severe blood loss. Uh, platelet abnormalities, well, let's start off with what is normal. Uh, that would be the average concentration of 350,000 per microliter of blood. And you can see in this picture of a blood smear, these little guys, the arrows are pointing to our platelets. So they're in lower numbers, obviously, compared to the red blood cells themselves. Um, thrombocytopenia is low platelet count. That is 80,000 or less, usually due to the excessive platelet destruction or inadequate production. In clinical signs, you would see uh, bleeding along the digestive tract, within the skin, or occasionally inside the CNS, which usually uh, give us this symptom. Uh, thrombocytosis, or a high platelet count, which would exceed 1 million per microliter, is usually due to an increased production because of infection, inflammation, or cancer. Finally, the last section, uh, 7, hemostasis. This involves vascular spasms, platelet plug formation, and blood coagulation. Hemostasis is a process that halts the blood and prevents loss of it through the walls and damaged vessels. It also establishes a framework for repair. It consists of three phases that I just mentioned and we're going to talk more about here. Uh, phase one includes a vascular phase. Uh, blood vessel walls contain smooth muscle and simple squamous epithelia known as endothelium. When you cut the wall of the blood vessels, this causes a vascular spasm of that smooth muscle which can slow down or stop bleeding, lasts about 30 minutes, and the, those endothelial cells will also become very sticky to allow the platelet phase to begin, and the platelets will attach themselves to that sticky surface within 15 seconds of injury, and as more and more arrive, you form a platelet plug, leading us to the coagulation phase, which actually starts 30 seconds after the vessel damage. A coagulation is actually blood clotting, just another fancy word for it. And that involves a complex sequence of steps that convert fibrinogen to fibrin to form that blood clot that is going to seal our damaged area. And so this is the uh, clotting process. It uh, is, well, first of all, you have to have clotting factors have to be present to form the clot to begin with. And that includes calcium and 11 other proteins. And this is the process of the coagulation phase, which obviously looks very complicated. It has three main pathways, the extrinsic, common, and intrinsic. I would just suggest drawing this uh, pathway, and we are going to talk more about it in class on the details because it is very intricate. And we are done with Chapter 11. I'll see you guys in class.